100 years ago, author, editor, and civil rights activist Freeman Henry Morris Murray published Emancipation and the Freed in American Sculpture, 1916 a pioneering study of the depictions of peoples of African descent in art. Although Murray's primary focus was on figural works produced by some of the leading, i.e. white, American and European sculptors in the latter half of the 19th century, his sculptural survey also included works by several important African American artists, such as Mary Edmonia Lewis and Meta Vo Warwick Fuller, and thus, his book can be marked as one of the very first historical and critical studies of black American art. Since Murray's publication 100 years ago, the art historical literature on black artists, their artistic production, the aesthetics of racial difference and cultural distinctiveness from a rare and um, has grown incrementally and phenomenally, from a rare and happenstance phenomena at the beginning of the 20th century to a relatively common occurrence in the first decades of the 21st century. A non-scientific method of gauging this proliferation of art historical scholarship on African American artists and their works would be a simple comparison, say between 1916 and 2016, of the frequency with which known African American artists are referenced in the popular literature. For example, in 1916, the names of only three black artists, William Edward Scott, Henry Asawa Tanner, and Meta Warwick Fuller would have appeared more than once in newspapers and art journals nationwide. In contrast, in 2016, no listing of significant contemporary artists would be considered accurate without Mark Bradford, Nick Cave, Theaster Gates, David Hammonds, Lyle Ashton Harris, Barkley L. Hendricks, Rashid Johnson, Glenn Ligon, Steve McQueen, Kerry James Marshall, Wangeshi Mutu, Chris O'Feely, William Pope L., Lorna Simpson, Hank Thomas, Hank Willis Thomas, Micheline Thomas, Carol Walker, Carrie Mae Weems, Gehendi Wiley, and Fred Wilson, among many, many other black artists of note. 1915, 2016. So here we are in 2016, reflecting, thinking about collecting and presenting works by artists of African descent. Thelma Golden, Holland Carter, Jack Shaneman, Pamela Joyner, Franklin Sermons will lead us in this reflection, in this meditation. And I suspect that the thrust of our discussion tonight will focus on that roster, that roll call of artists I just gave you. So my first question to our, our panel is that what makes this moment, the second decade in the 21st century, such an especially exciting and vital moment for contemporary artists of African descent. <laughs> um, I'll just say that, uh, you know, I, I'm probably the, in years, the senior member of this panel, and I grew up in the 1950s and 60s in the United States, in a white bread United States. I went to museums when I was a kid. And I saw no um, African-American artists at all. I lived in Boston, Massachusetts. It was a big town. We had many museums, very sophisticated museums. So, uh, and nor was there any African art. <laughs> that was the other thing. Uh, if you wanted to find African art in Boston, Massachusetts in the 1950s and 60s, you had to go to an ethnological museum. Uh, Harvard, it was the nearest one. The way that African-American and African culture came into my life was uh, through my dad, who was a jazz and gospel uh, f fanatic. <laughs> so uh, I was hearing this music all the time. Uh, my mother was also an opera fanatic. So I was hearing like Billie Holiday, Mahalia Jackson, and Maria Callas. You know, those are my... <laughs> Otherwise, it would not have been in my life. Um, and so that's... And now, of course, it's an entirely different situation. We've had, until recently, a, a museum for African art in New York City, which is now gone, which is too bad. 
but um, so the the uh, the difference is enormous over the over those years of what I can see now, what I can experience now, of African American and African art. Some of the why now question could be answered by considering things like your work and the contribution that you've made. And so what I think very specifically is at this moment, we've been able to finally actualize on what has been generations of art historical work, curatorial work, institution building, right? Um, both within the black community and outside, that now all together has come together in a way that it lives within the center of not just our consciousness, but the center of our sense of a cultural life. And that that is long overdue in some ways, but in many ways beautiful because it does come right with this foundation, the foundation that was created by all those exhibitions, all of the writing, all of the work that have been done for many, many years to say that we cannot talk about American art, we really can't talk about contemporary art, we can't talk about global art unless we're talking about the contributions of black artists. I would also suggest something that's a little bit of a, a business perspective, which is the perspective I come from. And I think now we're at a moment where many artists of color uh, are benefiting from what I call the golden triangle. So the golden triangle is that convergence of critics slash curators, collectors, and the distribution channel. So if you go back to, what was this, uh, 100 years ago? There, were, there was no distribution channel. Um, there were no collectors of the art. And you know, there was a void in these other areas. And so virtually all of the artists you listed have all three of those attributes and variables converging uh, to their benefit. Uh, so and if you're a collector, um, you're, 10 years ago, you, you couldn't call up Jack and say, give me a roster of. 20 artists, or maybe Jack, but, but almost no one else. But now there are, there are many, many distribution outlets so that you can actually buy the work, um, understand the work, uh, and absorb and enjoy the work. I'm looking at Franklin and I realized I forgot to mention Jean-Michel Basquiat. <laughs> well, I think that points to um, something that I think is invention. And I'm reminded of looking through the galleries today, and there's a moment in here where Picasso kind of drowns amidst these works by Purvis Young, uh, this conversation that Bob Thompson is having. Uh, and there's this sort of inventive curatorial that picks up on history, and that picks up on the work that has been done. So I think that. There's something to be said, like when, I can't help but think of one of the um, first books I wrote about was uh, a, a review of your book and with the Raymond Saunders on the cover and have devoured that book several times. And the fact that it provides this lens for us to think through uh, artists is invaluable and I think has made a, a major uh, contribution to to why we are here now and why we can speak about uh, these artists in that way, in this moment in that way. I think Thelma's point was really important because it did take all of that building and that foundation. And then, you know, today, I mean, I think Holland has been so important with this because he has championed in the New York Times so many artists of color and artists from outside and you know, brought the attention to them in a you know, very scholarly way. I think that's so important. I think what Thelma has done at the Studio Museum is amazing. What you've done, the shows you've put on, the artists that you brought along, Franklin as well. So I think it's a building on all of those things and a moment in our, you know, in our time where people are trying, they want to learn about or think about what's happening now. And, um, so I believe that that's what's happening. I want to add a little bit to what you've all said from my perspective, and it has to do with the 21st century as being such a hyper visual moment. Um, and, and it's been in the works since the late 20th century. And one could say, particularly starting in the 1980s, 
the proliferation of, of, of digital images and, and, and cable and, 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 and satellite and, and, and the ability for us to see and grasp things, images from, from all over the world has to factor perhaps a little bit into this. And I'm thinking in particular of the, the, the end part of, of the title of our panel tonight, Artists of African Descent. This is a, a term, a concept that's been used historically, but it takes particular resonance, I would say, as we move from the 20th century into the 21st century. There is a real sense that, that, that U.S., France, UK, South Africa, Nigeria, Senegal, Jamaica, Haiti, that these parts of the African diaspora, um, they've been in conversation with one another, but they seem especially in conversation with one another. Could you all speak, any of you, to the fact that we're talking about this globally? I think of a moment, say, around 1996, 1997, and looking at the proliferation of, of exhibitions that took on exactly that theme that you just said. Uh, shows like Inclusion Exclusion uh, by Peter Weibel in 96. Then followed that year not only by this sort of grand tour of, of Venice, of Munster, of Documenta, but at that moment, it was one of the first times I think where you also had Johannesburg for the second time. You had Istanbul, you had Guangzhou uh, picking up on, on Dakar we even Think of those exhibitions and what it meant to a developing dialogue um, that was precipitated in many ways by communication and by the fact that email was becoming more of, of a vehicle for sharing information and such an easy way to do that. It also, I mean, uh, Franklin has marked that moment, but I would say I'd pinpoint it very specifically to Oakley and Wazor's Johannesburg Biennale, mm -hmm. right? Both that term, mm -hmm. artists of African descent, and the idea that the imperative was that we weren't gonna speak about a kind of black history that cited itself in America and then an engagement with the diaspora. But we were sort of almost talking about rethinking Africa as the center and looking at artists of African descent as emanating from that center. And that's when I think that really happened mm -hmm. and we began to think of it that way. And when you look at the list of the artists that were included in that exhibition, in many cases it predicts in a way that's incredibly brilliant the way in which this dialogue would play out now 20 years later. Mm -hmm. Like literally, that checklist alone. Thank you. I think my wake up moment for, Af for African art mm -hmm. was uh, Susan Vogel's exhibition Africa Explores at the Museum for African Art in New York. Um, it was the first time I was aware of the wealth and the breadth of art, that was, contemporary art that was being produced on the continent. Um, I had a fixed image in my mind, I think, that uh, of what we call traditional African art was African art, and that was the definition of it. And it just broke up all my definitions. It just threw them away, and I had to start all over again, and, which is a thrill, of course, because <laughs> it just opened this wonderfully rich world. And it was a very experimental show. You know, it was in an Upper East Side townhouse, and it was this very not Upper East Side townhouse-y kind of art. And <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's when things started to change for me, I think, with, with that show. And uh, yeah. Um, I was just thinking of uh, around 89 and thinking about um, uh, some of the exhibitions within that moment and coming back to a sort of New York moment that perhaps precipitated some of the international conversation around uh, exhibitions like the Decade Show mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. thinking about how we represented uh, ourselves within an American context that I think would not have existed without the ties outside to Africa, to Asia, to beyond. Franklin, I'm so glad you mentioned the Decade Show, and I remember the premiere of Looking for Langston by Isaac Julian, a black British artist who does this incredible meditation on, not so much on Langston Hughes, but on 1989 mm -hmm. and being uh, a black gay um, artist and, and, and individual um, in a world that, that opens its eyes to, to, to this new persona, you know. 
And, and so the late 80s really is implicated here, um, and particularly in terms of that route between New York and, and London. Yeah. yeah. Something that Thelma has talked about a lot, I think, within that conversation, we also were reminded of it with sensation around the same time and Chris Ophelia's presence so huge looming over that exhibition uh, was also part of that moment. And then thinking about Magician de la Terre mm -hmm. from the same year, which widens the circle even more and goes towards, say, that installation that we see now, where you have this idea of self-taught and vernacular playing such an important role vis-a-vis -vis the Picasso on the other side of the room. And I, I, these shows that I felt were so important did not come from the center. Right. They came from the edges, from the periphery. And I think it woke me up, I, just speaking personally, to take my focus off of the center and move my, my sights out. And I've kept them there because once I did, I realized that's where the interesting stuff is happening. Mm. Still is. Mm. 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 Except now we don't call it the margin anymore. We don't call it the margin anymore. <laughs> no. True. We don't call it the margin. No, we don't. But you know, it's so important, Holland, that you've been doing that because you really are such a champion of that. And it's always so interesting to read what you write. And I think it's so important. You know, even when you think about the article that was in the New York Times a month ago on that Sunday, the big article that, you know, talked about this whole topic. And, you know, a few people came up to me and said, so, oh, it must be great now. Everything's all better and it's all done. <laughs> and, you know, wow. Yeah. And, but what that article does, it, at first it was so important that it was on a Sunday and then in the Times and, you know, front page. But I think what it does is it, people read that and it becomes kind of a shared consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, although things don't happen right away from it, it shows that, oh, this is happening. And a lot of people probably had no idea that all of this was going on. And, you know, so that's so important, I think, articles like that, things like that. But it was really interesting how everybody thought, okay, well, that's great, it's done. <laughs> and <laughs> there's a long way to go still, I think. So our experience with globalization is a little bit more pedestrian. About a decade ago, I had a need to move with my husband to London, and I began to meet artists like Isaac Julian and Frank Bowling and Chris Ophelia, and then you have this epiphany that this dialogue is um, a global one. And London is a really interesting place because not only is there sort of cross-fertilization between London and the U.S., but London's a really global city that, you know, attracts artists from really all over the world. And so that was a real eye-opener for us. And that's the moment at which we took our collection uh, to a global place. And our definition of the African diaspora um, now includes artists that do not necessarily identify themselves as black artist. Um, and so we have a whole narrative around how those individuals and how that work came into the con collection and dialogue, say, with African American abstract painting uh, from the 1940s. I mean, speaking of that article in the New York Times, I was thrilled and picked up the paper just like everybody else and saw one of the paintings in our collection pictured on, in that, on the front page of the New York Times. I said, oh, well, there it is. It's, it's OK. Um, um, but, and so, I mean, but the point is that, that ours is a really personal journey built building block by building block, not just with the individual paintings, but you know, just weaving in the personal experiences that, and dialogue we have with the individual artists. I'd like to push and dig a little further with you in particular, because you are representing the first part of our title, Collecting, on our panel. I want to kind of just ask you a little bit more about what does it mean to be a collector? We really view ourselves to be stewards of the work and stewards of the career. Ours is a mission-driven collection um, that we began more than 20 years ago when I met Laurie Sims, who said, you know, you're in business school and you're going to go to Wall Street and you're going to do your thing. But don't forget about collecting. I mean, it is the storehouse of our culture. And after all, when we're all gone, what remains is culture. 
Um, so I worked hard and put together my little pennies and like everybody I had walls to fill and then I began to meet artists and the first artist I became friends with um, was Richard Mayhew. Richard told me these stories about the spiral artists and how tough it was for them to build careers. And I said, oh, that's kind of like being an, an African-American woman on Wall Street. So I, could, <laughs> I get a chance to engage in a little bit of autobiography. And so we started on, on, this, on this journey. And so um, you know, we have what some might view to be you know, even an arrogant um, ambition, which is to work really hard to reframe the context of art history mm. and to try to place overlooked careers in the context of the broader canon. So that's what we have set out to do. Um, and you know, we buy work that was made anywhere from 1945 to work that was made 45 minutes ago. Uh, and it's a terrific and an interesting journey getting to know careers of the deceased, um, but the individual artist. So it's a lifestyle for us. I'm glad you mentioned um, meeting Richard Mayhew and that that's a part of the process for you that it's one thing to buy an object, it's another thing to engage with, with a mind, a creative mind. You, you confirm in me that the real value in artists as, 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 as founts of information and knowledge and insight that is just something quite special. I want to shift a little bit to Jack, because you are, you are representing our gallerists on this panel. And as a gallerist, you engage with collectors, you engage with artists. Um, could you say a little bit about how that works? Without the artist, we have nothing, first of all. And, you know, the art is so important because besides being, you know, a decorative object, maybe in some cases, they're vessels of meaning and content. And I think, you know, that's one thing that we might want to talk about at some point because a lot of the work that's being collected today or that's very revered is work that has both. It has an aesthetic quality, but it also has a lot of meaning, especially now. So that's really important. And um, finding artists that you think are really smart and making really good work is very important. And as a gallerist, I have to choose things, but also exhibit them and then you know, not everybody likes everything. So it's about, you know, believing in it enough to defend it. And that's really important. But yeah, we are kind of the link between the artist and the collector. And, you know, different collectors. I mean, Pamela, it's so interesting because she really knows. And probably from all those days on Wall Street, too. She, mm. But, you know, a lot of collectors, you help them, you guide them, you show them things, you let them know about things that they might have interest in, hopefully they do. And sometimes it takes years and years for people to come along. Sometimes the artists are so ahead of us that it takes a while for you know the dust to settle down and people go, oh my God, yes, mm. that's so interesting. I want to just add one thing to what Jack said, and that is Jack is the only gallerist I know of in New York City who has been, goes to Africa to look at art mm. and to find it, track it down and find it. And that's a very uh, wonderful thing. And um, I'd like to also pay tribute, if I could, to Claude Simard, uh, his, who died last year, uh, because uh, Claude also did this. And, and he, was a, he was a wonderful person and with a great curiosity. And um, he, yeah. Okay. Well, he really championed this cause, I have yeah, to say. Yeah. And well, we always love to bring things in from outside. And you know, bring things into the arena that maybe hadn't been considered or hadn't been represented. And so both of us really love that. And it's so nice to remember him in that way. But yeah, we made a lot of crazy trips, <laughs> looking at a lot of things and going far, far, far to find something that wasn't quite what we were looking for. It was interesting, I was talking to Trevor earlier about how studio visits happen, and sometimes when you go to cities, there's the one person who's gonna tell you everything to look at. But, you know, I prefer, and then the same, somebody else comes back to the city and they tell the same person to go see those same artists again. I really prefer to find the artists that like nobody's been to, or you know maybe they didn't go to school, but they have to make art every day because that's what they do. 
And so I'm very fortunate in that sense where I like to bring into the arena something that maybe hasn't been seen before or thought about. We've got two presenters on, as bookends on this panel, and I want to go to this second verb, presenting. Um, works by artists of African descent. Any thoughts on, on, on how you might frame a, a response to this idea of, I mean, is it any different than presenting artists who are not of African descent? Um, what, are the, what are the particular things that one keeps in mind as one engages with this idea of making it available for the world to see? Thelma Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> there is this this past, this history that we've talked about, that we've referred to, as thinking of your, your 20th century book. And so there are these, these, this history that I feel fortunate enough to be able to work from and to work with. I also had Thelma as a mentor as early as being in college. So it, uh, it goes a ways back. And you see the ways in which we build on the history, and I think that's, to me, that has been, that is why I wanted to curate, is because you want to be able to look at the story, expand upon the story that is there, and then take it somewhere else. And if I think back to Lowry's exhibitions at the Met, or if I think very specifically to Thelma's exhibitions, say, Black male, which that was when we got out of school. So <laughs> this that, is now turning into how old I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at Trevor, actually. I know, I know, I know all of you. I, I, I feel it. I, I know what's happening but, here. <laughs> but it was like, this is a new way. This is a new way of presenting the work. This is the, the, the place that you get to jump off. This is how you get to Oakley's exhibition, right? Mm. So. Mm. You, you get to think about the presentation of the work in context that evolve. And, and, and it's, it's been amazing going around the collections here because you don't, in most places, you do not get the sense that there is so much depth, that there is so much history. We're in the state that Bearden was from. We're in this place where Aaron Douglas has been everywhere that we've looked. And that doesn't happen in most places. So you have this, this, this foregrounding and this history from which to work from that automatically allows you to see things uh, in, a, in a different way. And I think that has been, for me, the presentation of, of this art within a context has been about that. And it has always been about, I think one of the things that I, I, mean, I learned so much, but in seeing is that nothing exists in a vacuum and this idea of context like walking into the gallery now and looking at Dario Robleto on one side of the room and then Dario Escobar next to him and then Kerry over here. There's these, these juxtapositions that people like Trevor make that allow you to see things differently and thus you cannot help but do something different. Well, first on the vanity point, when Franklin was in college, I was just out of college. So let's just, you know what I mean? Like, okay, just for clarity here, I was, you know, two years out of college working at the Whitney. And so, you know, there isn't this great distance of, of what we're talking. But okay, to your question, um, is it different presenting? Yes. I have never seen curating the work of artists of African descent as a neutral act. I have never seen it as not being an act in which every single decision is about writing the history, rewriting the history, rethinking, reimagining. I've never seen the museum as a neutral space because we, as a curator, I've always operated in institutional settings, first at the Whitney, where I became a curator at 26, so that's the other part of the story, <laughs> thinking about what I wanted to be as a curator. So, you know, I was not just a curator at the Whitney, I was a very young curator trying to imagine what it would be given that I knew that coming into that institution I was walking into a very particular history and one that I knew I had to have a very important impact on through my presentation of artists of African descent and then leaving the Whitney to go to the Studio Museum in Harlem, another institution with a very particular history similarly. So I cannot think of this sort of void of curating as something that I'm doing that is simply an intellectual act. It is highly, highly, highly political as it relates to this thinking of what 
the entire narrative has to be about. Thank you. Both you and Franklin have introduced the word curating. And it dawns on me that if we look at this word collecting and we look at this word presenting, that curating in some ways borrows from both of those spheres, the idea of a discerning eye that, that, that whether it actually physically obtains something or corrals a body of things. And then we have on the other side, presenting. The idea that these things that you have corralled and marshaled need to be seen in relationship with one another within a particular space, what have you. Curating black. I mean, this is an idea that, that as I said, isn't just you know, the, the job of a curator in a museum, but it actually kind of goes back to our galleries, to our homes, you know, how, we, how we use our filters to think about a particular you know, kind of body or collection of work. Pamela, I'm looking at you because I'm wondering what it's like to walk into Pamela Joyner's home and to see what you have curated on your walls. Well, first of all, we talk to our paintings. We do. <laughs> the core of our collection really is sort of mid-20th century. And we have Jack Whitten and Sam Gilliam and Mel Edwards and Al Loving. And we say, hi, Jack, you know, when we walk into <laughs> our house. And so it's, it's, it's personal in that way. And, but we see um, not only sort of the history of those people when they had no one but each other, to dialogue with. There were, I mean, at that point in time, there were no Jack Shamans when these great artists were making their early careers. And so they formed these bonds, personally, that they have to this day. We see that dialogue and we hang them in dialogue. And then you take an artist like a Jack Whitten, who has said in my home to a large group of people, without Norman Lewis, he would not have had a career. And so. You know, Thelma and, and Franklin both have highlighted this strand of intergenerationality that naturally flows through this practice of collecting or curating art uh, made by artists of the African diaspora. Similarly, uh, Mark Bradford would say he has looked to Jack Whitten as someone who has helped him frame his thinking uh, because Jack is a great maker of paintings as opposed to being a painter of paintings. And of course, Mark is one of the greatest uh, makers of paintings. And so when I buy a painting and hang it on the wall, I hear all of those stories. And for me, that harkens directly back to the very first conversations I had more than 20 years ago with Richard Mayhew, who told me all of these stories about his peers and his predecessors. So I hear that and I see that every day in life and in my home. Thank you. Writing for the New York Times, seeing a range of exhibitions. I'm thinking about um, both kind of solo exhibitions by individual artists. I'm also thinking about theme shows. I'm thinking about uh, exhibitions that um, might fall under the rubric survey. Um, these are all different ways that um, curators curate and um, artists present it. Um, but I would imagine from the vantage point of a close um, observer and, and commentator that, 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 that these are different experiences. The exhibit of many different things versus the exhibit of one body of particular work or the exhibit that is a kind of a willful statement of an aggregation of, of a particular idea. It's true, of course. And um, one I've noticed, I was talking to someone earlier today, but the experience of, for example, the Nasher Museum, um, is, for me, is an ideal size museum. I like smaller rather than larger. I get more out of it. I think you can have a more intimate experience and you can uh, encounter artists one object at a time. That's my preferred way of doing things. In general, though, uh, solo shows are, I find, particularly rewarding if they're um, bringing into the spotlight a history that hasn't been told before, someone who hasn't been known before. I was very struck um, yesterday going to the uh, gallery at the North Carolina Central, 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 sorry, Central University. It's a small gallery, which is I liked right away. And there were names there I had never encountered before. So there are histories sitting in that room right now that are waiting to be told. 
and I'm hoping there are graduate students out in this audience tonight, maybe, who will be taking up the cause, because to me, this is the most important part of my job, is to point out some of these things that haven't been paid much, of attention, much attention to. Um, I can't think of any other real um, good reason for me doing what I do, if, if, not, if not doing that. Um, just, it's a question of focusing it's people's attention. That's what it's about. Thank you. Franklin, you mentioned uh, Purvis Young a few minutes ago, and it occurred to me that something else that's been happening in the world of artists of African descent, and yet it seems to be of particular resonance in 2016, is this category, outsider, uh, self-taught, uh, uh, vernacular. And um, we had just recently the, 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 the death of the very distinguished Thornton Dial. And I should also mention to you that we have an extraordinary exhibit on Duke's campus um, in the um, John Hope Franklin Center of Lonnie Holly, curated by Diego Cortez, who's sitting in the audience. He was, I don't see, oh, there he is, okay. So, so I wanna mention this idea of the outsider artists in the 21st century, this, this artist who, who um, often is a person of African descent, um, often is not living in New York City, more like Alabama or Louisiana, um, who hasn't been a part of the scene in terms of the art schools and, 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 and or you know, what have you, but at the same time is found and, and, and one realizes that there's something quite special there that might actually have resonance with the David Hammonds and, 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 and other artists who, who seem to kind of see the world and use the world as, as, as part of their art? I see them as providing a certain, um, a bridge, a way to think aesthetically about a moment in between, say, uh, a, a, a Black Atlantic moment, a way to think about what happens to the context of art making, and I'm, I'm making this up, but the context of art making from an African diasporic imagination that is disrupted and must be taken up again against all means. Many times, obviously, you know, we talk of a, a, a quote unquote black aesthetic. And I do believe that there is something within that space of the self taught slash vernacular, a passage. Uh, that comes directly out of that link. And that you can't help but see so many of these artists in, say, a David Hammonds, as you mentioned, it's just there. Uh, and so that, that, that has been something that I've just found to be revelatory over and over again. Like looking at Mose Tolliver in the galleries now, I forget, there's, there's a one moment here where you have uh, is it clay on the bottom? Yeah. Uh, and then just above that, I think it was Tolliver. That's right. Um, so those sort of juxtapositions uh, illuminate not only a history uh, within the Western canon, but then also illuminate what happens in different contexts. And most specifically, since we are here, a context that originates very much in this space. I think also that you know, again, what you see in the installation here is something that also provides another set of questions. Because I think that just the way we had that sort of margin center question, artists of color mainstream, this issue of the outsider now is that new question of where that fits. You know, we had the privilege a couple years ago to have an amazing exhibition done by our former curator, um, Thomas Lax, who's now an associate curator at the Museum of Modern Art, called When the Stars Fall from the Sky. And he posited this as a way to understand a kind of regionalism, right? So where does the South fit into an understanding of a kind of blackness, a kind of black aesthetic making? And that exhibition put together this idea of the self-taught, the outsider with the conceptual, but tied it to this sort of rootedness right, around a sort of Southern identity. And it really was an exhibition that was about opening up this question of how we can understand this idea of the self-taught, the outsider in complex ways. I mean, the market has a way it's understanding it, right? Mm. And, and we know that those confines sometimes can get very narrow. 
But when, again, this is where curating, right, as a political act, creates space for really redefinition. And I think that's the space we're in now. Thank you. Thank you. Before we open this up to the audience, I want to also go back to something that Pamela talked about, and that's abstraction. Right now, at this moment, we have an extraordinary exhibit up at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts on Norman Lewis. And you mentioned any number of really important abstract painters, um, such as Sam Gilliam and, and Jack Whitten. And I'm also thinking of Howard Dina Pendel and, 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 and just a whole collection of amazing abstract artists of African descent. And as we know, this is a history that, that goes back in time. Norman was active in the 1940s with his abstraction, along with Hale Woodruff and others. And yet one could argue that it's in the 21st century where audiences seem to be able to, to, to not just embrace the figure, the black figure, but embrace the possibility of dreaming a figure, a voice, a movement, you know, in Alma Thomas's brushstrokes, or in Jack Whitten's careful geometries, or, or even we can include Bob Thompson, his, his wonderful fields of color that you've seen in our galleries here. So I was just wondering, Pamela and, and, and Jack, you're looking at the whole scope of, of, of this work. Black abstraction, um, could you say a little bit about how how it, how it functions in your kind of purview of, of, of collecting and uh, of, 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 of kind of imagining, you know, black visuality. We have a really particular view. What our collection is, is um, roughly 100 artists, many, many, many more works than that, primarily painting, primarily abstraction. Um, and, you know, we came to this appreciation of sort of this aesthetic. Um, again, so, through some of these stories that I alluded to and referred to earlier, but it strikes me that abstraction has a number of characteristics. First of all, even outside of the context of the African diaspora, globally, abstraction seems to be subversive. Um, and artists of color in particular in this country who, who, you know, the Norman Lewises of the world began their careers as figurative painters and in the 1940s morphed into abstract painters. Um, and they could not find validation from the curatorial and critical community because those communities, the art world at that time, really wanted to see artists of African descent making identifiably black work. And so it was not considered valid that you know the humanity of these people, the fact that they're black was re resident in the work, it was just up to the observer to unpack that. Uh, similarly, the, the African-American community really didn't validate the work at the beginning, the dawn of the civil rights movement, because that community had a need to see uplifting images of, you know, black figures. So, I mean, I live in, in a region of the country not unlike this region of the country, the land of technological innovation. And it just struck me, uh, you know, at the, at, at the time when we really began collecting, that um, these mostly guys were real innovators, they were real pioneers, they had no validation, uh, they were true artists, and as I mentioned earlier, they had each other, they had communities of each other, uh, community of, you know, um, the group, um, they had other artists in the broader world that um, uh, gave them some validation uh, to a certain extent, but there was no possibility really in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s to be commercially successful as an artist of color making abstraction. So you had to feel compelled to make the work. Um, and you know that, I mean, and so now it's a different day. Um, and you know, there's been you know, sort of a generational change, uh, but I think that's sort of where the work emanates from. I'm, I'm looking at you, Thelma, and I'm thinking about the class that I just taught this past semester uh, on African American art, and we get to that point where P O S T hyphen B L A C K <laughs> comes up, <laughs> and we invoke your name and Glenn Ligons. Mm -hmm. And I want to extend this not just to you, but also to Jack and Holland, and it kind of brings us back to where we started, that something happened at the end of the 20th century um, and the beginning of the 21st century 
freestyle <laughs> is, is, was an emblematic exhibition. My, my students tell me this, you know, and, and it was. So what happened and how is it that the thing that happened took everybody's imagination? Rick, it's hard for me to have any distance from this particular question, the post-black question, or even this bigger question of artists of African descent, right? Because I'm a curator who has spent her entire career making exhibitions with black artists. I now am privileged to run an institution whose mission is to present, preserve, collect, and interpret the work of artists of African descent, right? So this is my full and total reality, right? All the time, right? I live in a world at which this is the center. Yes. The only one. And I am in the center of that center, right? So. It's so, true, it's that, true. So for that reason, you yeah. know, I come at this, yeah. you know, very differently than perhaps looking at it from the outside. So what I'll say about that moment is, I don't know if there was a need to think about that moment specifically, but I knew it needed to happen. That is, it was both personal and institutional. Personally, I had the privilege of working with a group of artists in the 90s that redefined the space for black artists in the art world. I really was just an active co-conspirator with them, but they were doing that. And you talked about collecting before. You know, I have to say as a curator, often one's work gets marked through this kind of lineage of exhibitions. But I actually think, and it's again what we see here in the gallery, so as a curator in an institution that collects, your legacy is really in what you can make happen in that collection. Right? And that's something I felt certainly when the Whitney reopened and I walked into that room with the David Hammonds, the Lorna Simpson, the Fred Wilson, the Jimmy Durham, and I could keep going, right? I could, I, I could see what was 10 years of active engagement and thinking about, right? Collecting in a very active way. So freestyle happened simply because in 2000, to imagine that there'd be a museum that had been born out of cultural specificity at a very particular moment, 1968. And I'm gonna stop here and give a plug for a book that the Duke University Press has published. And I think the pub date is like the 19th by Susan Kahan mm -hmm. called mm -hmm. Mounting Frustration. Mm -hmm. Let me say, write it down, everyone. Yeah. Pre-order on Amazon now. Yep. <laughs> Very important book. Yep. Very important book. It felt to me like, has anyone like done their DNA and you get that report and all yeah. of a sudden you know all this stuff about yourself you didn't know? <laughs> no, serious. That's what reading Mounting Frustration was for me. Like it made sense of everything I know about myself as a curator in these institutional settings. So freestyle had to happen simply because it was like the reset button. Like, you know, how, how could a studio museum imagine itself in the 21st century if it wasn't doing the same thing it did in 68, mm -hmm. which was opening up new territory? Mm -hmm. Now, certainly, you know, when I'm opening new territory, a lot of times I'm just opening it for myself, right? It was really a way to think, how can I open some space for a group of artists that needed to be able to, on the one hand, honor the legacy, as Pam has said, this intergenerational legacy, but on another hand, live and step into the world themselves as artists, and that's what... Freestyle was about, that's what Post Black was about, and that's what that moment, I think, opened up and offered some possibility. Yeah, I was actually, I actually went to that um, show, Harlan on my mind. I wandered into it by, almost you by wrote about this. No, you wrote about, <laughs> no, Holland wrote about this. Again, Google that, it was a fantastic. You talked about that. Yeah, I did, walking I had that experience, in. walking and not knowing what was going on with that show. I had no idea what it was about. But um, moving ahead, uh, you know, freestyle gave me an opportunity, just, just as Africa Explores gave me an opportunity to do this, freestyle gave me an opportunity to look and see the breadth of work that was being created within a category that I had always, uh, that I had tended to treat rather narrowly. And that was a huge gift to me. My background is in South Asian art, Indian art. That's where I was doing my graduate work in. So I was already coming from some place that wasn't New York centric or, or even Western centric. And um, so, Freestyle just opened that possibility for me, and I was very, very grateful, and I went for it. Uh, in my career, I, t I find myself tending to go for content in art. <laughs> I, I look for it, and I, it, it's what moves me, and when I find art that's being made under what I perceive as some kind of pressure, that particularly moves me, that art really interests me a lot, and um, that's what I found in that show. You know, this could go on and on, but, um... Uh, but it can't. <laughs> so thank you, Franklin Sermons, Pamela Joyner, Jack Shainman.
Colin Carter, and Thelma Golden. Thank you so much.